everything paranormal. Para X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Merry meet and merry part, bright the cheeks and warm the heart. For tread the circle thrice about to keep unwelcome spirits out. Bide within the law you must, in perfect love and perfect trust. Mind the threefold laws you should, three times bad and three times good. These eight words the read fulfill, and ye harm none to what ye will. Welcome to Stirring the Cauldron on the Para-X Radio Network. And now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Merry meet everybody and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. My guest tonight is Denise Alvarado, and we'll be talking about her latest book, Marie Laveau Voodoo Grimoire. Denise was born and raised in the rich Creole culture of New Orleans, Louisiana, and she's the author of numerous books, including The Magic of Marie Laveau and The Voodoo Doll Spellbook. And she's also a teacher of Southern Conjure at Crossroads University. Now, chat room questions and comments are always welcome. And if you're listening live and out of the chat room, you can join us here at paraxradionetwork.com. Hi, Denise, and welcome. Hi. Thank you for having me. Well, I had to. It's a really good book. Um, <laughs> um, true. Um, and it okay, so it's a practical guide to New Orleans style magic, and it's inspired by the life and traditions of Marie Laveau. And I know that most of those listening are familiar with Marie Laveau, but for that handful who might not know or those just know her by name only, um, would you mm-hmm. give a little background about the Queen of New Orleans? <laughs> sure. Marie Laveau was born in 1801 in New Orleans, and so right at the turn of that century. And um, she's known and popular for being the voodoo queen of New Orleans, but she was so much more than that. The things that we love her and adore her for the, her uh, charitable works, because she's really known to be a, a nurse. She um, would help a lot of people who were suffering from the plague at the time and the, um, well, yellow fever, I should say, the mm. pandemic. That lasted for six or seven decades. So, she her entire life she was living through a pandemic, wow. and helping sitting right next to people and helping them one on one, using her herbal remedies and whatnot to and prayer to help them heal. She also helped um, people um, prisoners and particularly those on death row. She was known for doing a whole lot of service for her community, and uh, those are things we really adore her for. And then we admire her because she was such a good businesswoman, too. She was born a free woman of color. Her her mother was enslaved, and her mother worked, um, was able to buy her freedom um, mm-hmm. by being a market woman. But um, Marie Laveau became um, known for well-known for her uh, making a business out of hoodoo and voodoo. Um, well, she didn't call it hoodoo. It was voodoo at the time, but it was her voodoo looked a lot like our hoodoo and voodoo combined. What we what we see today. How did so she, she rise? Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, I was just wondering. How, there were other people doing the same kind of work, but she was yeah. very special. So, what? I guess what you were just talking about is how she rose above. <laughs> Um, the other practitioners and got to be so well known and revered, you know? Um, yeah. It just was kind yeah. of amazing. Well, there was um, a lot of competition back then between the, <laughs> between the voodoo queens. Mm-hmm. Then she, she came into prominence around the 1850s, a little after. That's when she was most, became most, you know, the queen of queens. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, but, you know, she was effective. And she had a charisma, and uh, she did a lot of community service, like I said. And she did a lot of, uh, you know, every year she had her famous feast on the, uh, either on Bayou St. John or Lake Pontchartrain. And it was, uh, you know, the Holy Day of Voodoo is what we know mm-hmm. now, what we call it. She started that, where everybody would get together and celebrate the voodoo spirit um, on June 23rd and St. John's Day. 
So, you know, she did that, and so she made a name for herself with that, and she had all kinds of connections with important people in the community, like mm-hmm. with law enforcement and with the, um, you know, the, the well-to-do population. You know, she was a hairdresser, too. Mm-hmm. She started out. And that's, uh, that's how she made a lot of her connections and how she got a lot of information. So she was able to gather, you know, some intel. Um, but because you know how it is when, when you're fixing your hair or when you go to the, the hairdresser, the people talk. Women talk. It's just that's <laughs> the natural thing, you know, that happens. And she, mm-hmm. she paid attention, though. So she would know the whole situation going on with, you know, a, a particular couple. And um, it, it, there might have been problems or whatever. And one of them would come to, come to her for um, a resolution. Maybe another one would come to her to break up. And then she would work with both of them. Um, with the information she had to uh, help them achieve their goals, so she well, was you, she was very kind. I like the introduction of the book um, that she never wrote things down, not because she didn't want to, but she couldn't because she was illiterate. And right. you said that the grimoire um, becomes kind of an imagining of what she would have written had she been able to. Right. Right. And it does, you know, I do include a lot of uh, secondhand accounts of people who were um, followers of her, um, the children of people who actually, you know, um, were part of her uh, congregation. Um, So we have a lot of her works by people um, passing it down through oral tradition. And those Mm -hmm. things were written down. some things were written down half accurately in the newspapers, um, but more accurately during the uh, Depression mm-hmm. when the Federal Right Project um, was created to by the federal government to employ out-of-work writers. Mm-hmm. So one of the projects we had was to go and interview people and learn about you know folk practices of um, African Americans at the time and. Um, they wrote it down, and we have it. You know, it's it's un, most of it's unpublished, so you have to access it through the library and pay pay a lot of money to access it. But um, yeah. it's still available, and that's that's a lot of the stuff that I that I um, pass on in my books. Mm-hmm. So <clears> how did you get <laughs> how did you get introduced to voodoo? My introduction was when I was a very small child. I was like five or six years old, and it was my aunt who taught me about uh, communicating with the spirits, and uh, she taught me how to do seance, and uh, she taught me about um, cleansing with water and herbs, those kinds of things. Um, And so it was planted, the seeds were planted with me when I was very young. Um, And uh, my interest is, I had a natural you know, tendency towards spirit. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was able to dream things, and um, so I had I had experiences when I was young, and I think when she, you know, taught me uh, these things, it helped to put some of that into perspective. And it it was it laid a foundation for me later on in life, particularly when I became an adult, um, and I wanted to like really kind of uh, explore this background of mine, you know, of my culture uh, in more mm-hmm. depth. Um, but yeah, that's where it started when I was really little. And kept on going, which is the right way. Keep learning until right. we wear dust. Um. Right. Uh-huh. And I would experiment, you know, as I was growing up, I would experiment with different things, you know, and just kind of like kids do, <laughs> kind of playing around with things. Like uh, my first, my first uh, experiment that, that, um, well, I wouldn't say it was my first experiment, but my first one with a voodoo doll, I should, I should say, mm-hmm. was when I was in fourth grade. And um, I, uh, it, we had a teacher. I'm not going to say what class or anything because I don't know who might be listening to this. <laughs> and, <laughs> Big ears, yes. But, you know, it was a long time ago uh, in the 60s. So, um, but, uh, yeah, it was a teacher that we had, and he, um, we didn't, the students didn't like him. He just was not real nice or mm-hmm. relatable, you know. And uh, in fact, we didn't like him at all. Um, so 
he went on, uh, he was gone for a couple of days. I think he went on a little vacation or something. And, and I did a little voodoo work with him on my doll. And, um, it sounds terrible. I know because, you know, I was so little and here I am wanting this guy to burn or whatever. But when he came <laughs> back, he did, he had, he had like second degree burns from, oh. mm-hmm. from laying on a beach or something like that. But yeah. So I mean, at that point it was like, Oh wow. You know, actually, had I really like you know focused my intention in this thing, what else mm-hmm. did I do? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was and a that good was start. In fourth grade. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really good start. <laughs> um, you know, okay, so I've got a grimoire due out later this year, and I've been asked several oh. times about what a grimoire is, and I yeah. kind of define it loosely as a cross between a spell book, a cookbook, and the farmer's almanac. Um, What's your definition of the grimoire? Well, I would agree with that. That's a that's a very good um, description of what a grimoire is. But I think it also can can differ between who who's writing it, right? Yeah. I mean, what yeah. our goals are. Mm-hmm. But it, it, just that it's very basic. A grimoire is a book of instructions, of magical instructions mm-hmm. of some sort. So it's yeah. it's it's a book that will tell you how to do magical operations or you know explain things. All the things you, you know that you just mentioned. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's 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 a cross between a spell book and um, just instructions for doing things in a magical way. Yeah. But I also wrote this particular book um, following the the model of the domestic receipt books that were uh, popular in the 19th century and early 20th centuries. Mm. And the domestic receipt books. We're like the common man's <laughs> grimoire, basically the person who's the non-witch, non-magical uh, practitioner uh, grimoire, because it, the domestic receipt books were also uh, a book books of instructions of how to manage mm-hmm. a household, you know, doing anything from cleaning your floors to brightening your whites to, you know, um, cooking foods, and it would have you know the recipes in there, and. Um, I, I love those old um, receipt books. You can find them online. People have put them online now. And mm-hmm. um, uh, there's just all kinds of cool information in there. And I just like the way they're kind of loosely uh, organized. And, and they remind me of spell books. So it just I wanted to include some of that practical information, but from a magical standpoint. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to clean your floors, how do you do that? Uh, in a magical way with what kind of a magical formula that will help clean it, but also, you know, um, bless your, bless your home at the same time or, mm-hmm. or, you know, um, draw, you know, prosperity or harmony, you know, whatever it might be that you're looking for, for your home, how you can do that just in everyday mundane tasks. Mm-hmm. There's <laughs> so much you can do to a grimoire. I was, you know, I was thinking about, okay, I had the basic thing, what, uh, what I was thinking about, but how should I present it? You know, I mean, it just. Right. And and she said, um, do it. Do it what you want to do it, the way you want to do it, because it's your own grimoire. And there's exactly. no there's no rules to it, you know, and, and it was right. kind of difficult because there was a chap. There was a whole bunch of things that didn't kind of fit into chapters. And so I made a chapter mm-hmm. said, saying this and that. And, you know, and, and I thought they were yes. going to. I thought they were going to change it, but they didn't, you know, so it's yeah. like, wow, it's, it's really good free will to whatever you want to get out there. Um, you know, whatever you want to teach people and whatever that, right. The easy way to go. And I, I have a chapter like that too, because like you said, when you, you start looking at all the information you have and you start thinking about everything, there are those bits of, of, um, tips and tricks and just insight and advice that don't necessarily fit in a, neatly into a category or you don't have enough of the same thing to make a whole chapter out of mm-hmm. you know, or a whole section out of. So, yeah, that's my last chapter, Sage Advice and Marvelous Secrets, because that's exactly what it is. It's just, <laughs> yeah. You know, stuff that's useful to know and I just didn't belong anywhere else, so I just stuck it in that particular chapter. Yeah, and I had my fingers crossed. I mean, what? Because you know, you when you get that, and the, I'm going to take that whole chapter out, and I'm going to be, you know, ten thousand words short. You know, <laughs> you start thinking about right. that. But right, yeah, but it, it's it. There's so many different types of grimoires. I mean, anybody go over to Amazon.com, 
and just look, you know, just put it in and they've got every topic that you can imagine and probably exactly. and a few more. Yeah. Um, exactly. Well, you created the book for kind of the modern witch and conjure worker and mm -hmm. it kind of provides, as we're talking about things in it, you've got formulas and recipes for solving things and, you know, things for daily living and enhancing quality of life in the um, Livo tradition, the voodoo tradition. So mm -hmm. how is that tradition different from any other types of voodoo? Well, uh, specifically, the Laveau voodoo tradition, and I kind of coined that term to differentiate it from, uh, like, New Orleans voodoo or Louisiana voodoo, because there are regional differences in all these practices. Mm -hmm. And for her, for this particular um, line of voodoo, it's, it comes directly from her. So mm -hmm. it makes sense that we call it Laveau voodoo. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the main things that is makes it different is her inclusion of um, a lot of Catholic elements into it. Mm -hmm. So New Orleans voodoo also has Catholic elements, but um, you don't. Not every New Orleans voodooist will um, subscribe to the Catholicism. There are people who you know are are Wiccan. There are people who are Buddhist. There are people who are atheists. You know, but just just go straight for voodoo. There are people who are practitioners of Ifa and other. Um, African-derived traditions. Um, but with Laveau voodoo, those are the people who practice the New Orleans voodoo that include the Catholicism. Mm -hmm. So that's the big um, set apart from the others. Mm, okay. <laughs> and there's a question in the chat room that's kind of what we're talking about. Um, she wants mm -hmm. to know what the difference is between voodoo spells and witches' spells, and should just anybody attempt the voodoo style? Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend anybody attempting either without some kind of proper introduction and a little bit of training somewhere, you know, from from somebody that you trust. Mm -hmm. um, there are differences in, in witchcraft and voodoo. Voodoo is based on an an African religion. So, um, you know, we have uh, we have certain things in, in, that we do in voodoo that's according to the spirits that that aren't present in witchcraft. Um, so that in itself is is different. Um, we don't necessarily pay as much attention to like moon phases and things like that, although some people do. Um, but it's it's pretty much like it's it's a do things as they as they are needed. Um, if if you need to do a working, um, and you need to do it like right away, but the moon phase may not be you know ideal, you do it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, if the, if the need is there, um, yeah. So, is there such a a thing as eclectic voodoo? You know, like in in the craft here with witches, you know, you take you can take a little bit from this, from a little bit from that, put it all together, and it makes it work. Um, mm -hmm. Does voodoo work the same way? Not in the same way. No, it, it okay. shouldn't. I mean, there are people who are doing that, but that's not uh, a, that's not tradition. Okay. The yeah. tradition. Now, now saying that, we do have a lot of influences. You know that and. And that's the thing I think that confuses a lot of people because in addition to the African um, foundation upon which it was um, it grew, mm -hmm. they, uh, it also assimilated a lot of the cultural influences that were present in New Orleans at the time, in the South at the time. So we do have European witchcraft influences. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's some Jewish mysticism in there. Um, so... There are other influences uh, in voodoo, but we have like a, uh, it's kind of hard to explain. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not eclectic in that. It's not, it's not a, a free for all. It's not a uh, just do whatever you want to do. There are guidelines mm -hmm. uh, to keep you within the tradition. So, um yeah, whichever the tradition may be. So it, it's it's like some of us are looking for a path to go, and some people are looking for um, 
the traditional like, and some mm-hmm. are doing the other way. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I guess nobody yeah. 100%. We do have some, okay. Yeah, we do have some Native American influence, too, particularly with with regards to the herbal um, mm. remedies and things. Mm-hmm. So that's, yeah, that's something else. Yeah. Um, well, you know, sometimes you get, you know, when you say the word voodoo, people get kind of nervous and jumpy. Um, yeah. And a long, long time ago, I had John T. Martin on the show. And mm-hmm. um, he, for people don't know, that he was with the um, Historic Voodoo Museum back then in New Orleans. And people kept telling me when they knew that he was coming on the show, um, be very careful. You know, he's a he's a voodoo priest and he's got snakes, oh. and, you know, all that stuff. Right. And, you know, right. be, on, be on guard and be very cautious. And, you know, he was the nicest man. He really was. Right. Um, you know, you yeah. listen to him. He's well, bless his heart. Now he's not with us. Um, right. But, um, you know, he he talked mm-hmm. so calmly and so wonderfully. I mean, like somebody's grandfather almost. And. Mm-hmm. He did explain voodoo um, in such a way that some of the people in the chat room were really surprised, you know, because it wasn't all these, what, chicken things and blood and, you know, whatever. Um, So why do you think that voodoo in general is a bit scary to people? Where does that come from? It comes from our racist colonial uh, past as a country is where that comes from, Mm. to be blunt. (laughs) Uh, You know, I mean, no, you think about it, you know, um, it's an African based tradition. Mm -hmm. And if you look at all the media references and and well, in colonial America, that would be uh, would be newspaper accounts. And it's always referred to as a dark continent and even the slurs, you know, they would call Africans as, you know, darkies and savages and uh, barbarians and. You know, it was it was all this this salaciousness that you could possibly, um, you know, summon up and mm-hmm. describe voodoo as that. And mm-hmm. it was because I think in part was motivated by the fact that people were threatened by them. The slave institution was mm-hmm. threatened by the Africans who were not being docile accepting of their enslavement there mm-hmm. were a lot of slave uprisings and mm-hmm. people were very scared of that from happening because it was very violent yeah. um in a lot of instances and um then especially when we got an influx of uh, slaves from a uh, population from haiti mm-hmm. uh, which before it was even called haiti um but uh that slave uprising was successful and it was mm-hmm. in part fueled by voodoo the belief in grigri the belief in um well Ursuli dantor who was the one of the loas that was um, petitioned for help in that uprising so they knew mm-hmm. that it could be very successful these uprisings and so they had to you know paint this picture of these very violent savage people um you know, who were cannibals and, you know, baby killers and all this stuff (laughs) that just simply wasn't true. But they printed it enough in the newspapers and, you know, that the population became really scared, you know. Mm -hmm. And at the time, like I said, you know, they should have been scared. (laughs) You know, they were (laughs) doing wrong, okay. Mm -hmm. They were doing wrong and the people were standing up to them and um, were being successful not uh, not all cases were successful. There was a lot of bloodshed, but the the point remains that these uprisings happened, and they had to keep everything under control. So fear is the best, one of the best, most effective ways of controlling a population, mm-hmm. right? It's a yes, great way to control society. So yeah. that uh, and that reputation of voodoo being a dark, evil satanic, you know, um, Mm -hmm. religion has just persisted, even Mm -hmm. though we don't have a devil in in voodoo, Mm -hmm. like, like there is in Christianity, there is no Satan or Lucifer in voodoo. So, Mm -hmm. uh yeah, 
I mean, it's it's so different than people knew. And it's funny. There's a chat room mess, uh, message. It says, "The mention of voodoo doesn't make me nervous and jumpy. The me- the mention of calculus makes me nervous and jumpy." Right. <laughs> well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, because you know, when you're educated about it, then you realize you, you know that voodoo is not about um, you know rising up and killing white people. You know, I mean. <laughs> At the time back then, they had to use voodoo was a voodoo was a, a, a tool of resistance. Mm-hmm. So it was a political tool for oppressed people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they had they had spirits that would help them. They had tools within the religion that would help. Um, certain formulas that they would use, um, you know, during during their insurgency and um, you know uh, during their activities for uh, resisting their slave masters. Um, you know, Grigri was one of those things that they that they would use, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, that's um. But that's, you know, uh, go ahead. I I think that every culture has those things, but mm-hmm. most of the time they keep it under wraps. And right. you know, it's okay. We're going to do this to this guy, but we're not going to talk about it. You know. <laughs> But, you know, right. sometimes the squeaky wheel does get the grease. And, you know, right. but it, it, I think um, the media is keeping that going like they do with witchcraft, you know, witchcraft are mm-hmm. all black magic people and we're killing people. And, you know, right. And so that doesn't help. I mean, it's great for no. entertainment, but it doesn't help. So are there a couple? We've got like three minutes before the break. Um, Mm -hmm. There are a few misconceptions that you really need to address about why people are getting still afraid of it. Well, the first thing is to become educated about it. Also, watch your watch your uh, sources of information. Um, Voodoo is about healing. It's about balance. It's about ancestor reverence. It's not about hexing and. There's, there's, there are those things, of course, in voodoo. I'm not going to say there's not. There's, mm-hmm. there's, you know, what we call the left hand works, and there's the right hand works, right. and there's all in between too. So, but the, that's not the primary um, focus of what voodoo is. Voodoo is focused on healing, and uh, you know, right relationships with, with people and the environment, the nature, and your ancestors. So. Um, that needs to be that needs to be emphasized over and over and over again. You know, I, I get contacted a lot, you know, by people who want to, you know, get revenge on somebody. You know, <laughs> I just don't do that. You know, you want to do that, go ahead and do that yourself. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah. that's not what I don't want that reinforced. And mm-hmm. I, I I do offer a free course at Crossroads University on, uh, called the intro, intro to New Orleans Voodoo that anybody is welcome to sign up for. And learn about um, the history and the basics of New Orleans food, and that's why I offer it for free because I really want the information out there. I want to, people to be educated on this religion, this tradition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean it's just funny how things go, and and in a way, voodoo is similar to witchcraft in certain ways. You know, um, mm-hmm. we do the puppets. You have the, you know. Yep. Um, the dolls, the voodoo dolls. Mm-hmm. Um, we do little bags and sach- sachets and stuff like that, the Greek grey bags. So, you know, there mm-hmm. is similarity. Um, but yep. as you said, you know, because some people are just like, no, they're absolutely two different things, but they're both bad. All witches are bad and all voodoo people are horrible. You know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you can't win for losing. But uh, what's no. the difference, um, real quick, between um, voodoo and hoodoo? Well, nowadays it's become distilled down to two separate tr- traditions that, you know, voodoo is a religion and hoodoo is African-American folk magic. Mm. Um, but in New Orleans, voodoo, it's not quite as separate as that. That happened, um, it wasn't, like I said, back in Marie Laveau's day, hoodoo and voodoo, what we call hoodoo and voodoo today, and, and and how we separate it today, it wasn't separate back when she was alive and practicing. Mm-hmm. It was 
she did not differ, differentiate what she was doing. She didn't say, oh, I'm doing hoodoo here and I'm going to do a voodoo ceremony. No, it was all voodoo to her. Mm-hmm. So she worked three green, um, which in itself is also a separate spiritual tradition that um, comes from Senegal. So when we uh, took that particular practice, um, and incorporated it into New Orleans voodoo way back in 17, 16, 1700s mm-hmm. when the slaves first started coming over. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, so um, th- nowadays it, I, I find it to be an artificial separation mm. um, okay. because, like I said, New Orleans voodoo has incorporated a lot of different cultural practices. And when I say that, it's not just different cultures like like your different continent Mm -hmm. um influences but different african cultures so we had the the you know uh, gris gris from senegal we've got you know um the congo influences which would be like the ancestor pots and um uses of cauldron um the the snake uh, worship that we have comes from wida so you know there's a lot of different cultural influences from Africa that were combined here because the populations were brought here and combined. They were living in such close proximity to each other. It was just natural that these things would, um, you know, they would influence each other. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we are going to take a quick break and we'll be back in two minutes. And when we do, we're going to delve deeper into the book itself. So stay put, everybody, and we'll be back in about two minutes. Way there's more stirring the cauldron with Marla Brooks right after these important messages. I was in the hospital with my son for 18 months. When he got injured, I wasn't prepared, but I knew I had to be strong. When I was told about John's injury, I was in complete shock. I just remember rushing into his room and giving him a big hug and letting him know I was there. These veterans and families are just a few of the heroes we serve at Homes for Our Troops. For thousands of severely injured veterans, everyday life is filled with barriers. It was really the the little things throughout the house. Counters that you can't roll up to. I had to drag my wheelchair down steps. I want to help, but he is so determined. At Homes for Our Troops, we build specially adapted custom homes with features like wheelchair access, rolling showers, and automatic door openers that allow them to function independently and focus on their recovery and family this house is freedom it's hope it's a new beginning this house has given me my family back to learn more visit hfotusa.org throughout time events have occurred that have shaped human history spirit voices from the past have many stories to tell and for the past several years Channelers Barry and Connie Strom have been conducting live channeling sessions and relaying those stories and messages from those on the other side. We invite you to tune in to Barry and Connie's new show, Channeling History, on the Para-X Radio Network, every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, as they relay the messages of those voices from the past, the ones who have witnessed history firsthand. And those who have made history themselves. Hey everyone, it's Marla. If you like tonight's episode of Stirring the Cauldron and the archive podcast as well, take a look at the show's YouTube channel and check out the dozens of shows that are there just waiting to be heard. New shows are added each week, and while you're there, why not subscribe? It's free. And if you click on that tiny little bell icon at the top of the page, you'll be notified when new shows are available. Just go to youtube.com and then type in Stirring the Cauldron Pair X and the link will appear. Just like magic. Welcome back to Stirring the Cauldron. Once again, here's your host, Marla Brooks. And my guest tonight is Denise Alvarado, and we're talking about her book, Marie Laveau, Voodoo Grimoire. 
There are so many things in the book that I'd like to talk about, but, you know, time never allows that. So I decided to do a bit of bibliomancy and let the divination do the choosing for me. So the first thing that came up with at random was Know Your Roots. Know Your Roots. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, that would have been um, in the Creole Cures and Remedies chapter, probably. Mm-hmm. When um, you, I just emphasize the importance of knowing what your what your plants are, knowing what your roots are, and not uh, mistaking uh, one for another, because it could be um, quite detrimental to do so. And some, yeah, I mean, some are you don't know which is which. I mean. Take a geranium, for example. They have all kinds of geraniums. You can't tell which, I mean, right. if you know, zonals and all the rest of them. Um, so, yeah, study up before you start right. playing with them, right? Right. And I think I wrote, I was talking, one of the examples I gave in the book was about uh, snake root. And there's a mm-hmm. couple of different snake roots. So you got to know, you know, like Samson snake root is used for male virility and love. But Seneca snake root, is used for protection against snake bites and also oh. can be used to avert evil. So those are very two different uh, <laughs> um, intentions and purposes of those uh, particular roots. So you got to know what you're, you you got to know your roots. And so Keep wherever, it, I mean, where, where's a good, pe- like people start doing that kind of work, um, what kind of a book should they open? I mean, what kind of things that, I mean, you have to learn your craft, right? So right. You, Got to read about books, read about the plants, read about all kinds of things before you start using them. Because, yeah, as you said, people can get in trouble that way. Right. Okay. So the next thing that came up, some of it made me laugh at first. Um, What's bend over (laughs) oil? Bend over oil. Bend over oil is a commanding and compelling oil. It's a coercive formula. So it's a formula that you would make when you want to get somebody to do what you want them to do, right? So mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's kind of crudely called bend over, but that's what it means. It's, it means, you know, bend over, bitch, and do my will. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's <laughs> it's not that kind like, of an energy. Mm-hmm. It's that kind of an in- energy to it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like a domination formula. And some of these formulas, um, let's talk about them because you have a lot of different oils and, and waters and things. Um, mm-hmm. they, do people have to go out and get special um, ingredients or is it just no, normal stuff that you can find anywhere? Well, one of, one of the things I really try to focus on in, in this book is, which separates it from my book uh, many years ago, the Voodoo Hoodoo Spell Book. One of the criticisms I, I got from that book was that there were just too many ingredients and a lot of the ingredients were hard to find. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to make this book because um, I listen to my criticism. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, I try to I try to give my um, readers what they what they're looking for you know and still remain authentic and um accurate so i really tried to make the formulas that i provided in the grimoire um three ingredients sometimes four but ingredients that were easier to find uh easy to find usually a lot of them can just be found in your kitchen cabinet Mm -hmm. so if you use spices at all of course i'm creole so we have spices in our kitchen (laughs) cabinet yes you do (laughs) um but uh most people have a lot of these spices most mm-hmm. people have pepper and cayenne pepper and mm-hmm. and basil and bay leaves and you know mint and things like this and and um those are the things that you um can use to make a lot of these formulas so mm-hmm. yeah um it it's really interesting cuz you know it's like it's recipes. You know, when somebody says recipe, yeah. you always think about food, but that's not always the case. I think recipes right. are for all kinds of things, and and making oils and, and good stuff like that is just exactly. as nice as putting it in your food dish uh, or right. your cooking. Yeah. All right. So then the next one came up, 
Um, all it said was the Rose of Jericho. Now, what's the Rose of Jericho? The Rose of Jericho is a um, is a plant that dries up in the desert and kind of looks like a tumbleweed almost. It's it's really dry when it doesn't when it's not uh, uh, when it's not rooted in the earth and when it's not during the rainy season. Mm-hmm. So it, it it dries up and it becomes a ball. It curls up in a dry ball and kind of the wind blows it off. You know, so um, you've got a basically a ball of dried leaves um but it's uh it's a magical plant because it's also called the resurrection plant and Mm. the reason it's called that is because you put it in water and in a little while it it starts to bloom it turns green because when you when you first put it in the water when it's in dry form it's brown Mm -hmm. and, and it's and it's brittle and it's crumbly but when you put it in the water then like a miracle happens, right? It resurrects itself. It turns green. It, it opens up. Um, it, it's a really beautiful plant, and it's uh, it's it's used for um, uh, like peaceful home um, uh, works. Um, it's uh, it was also it was comes out of um, the Bible too. There's a story in the Bible about how Mary clenched. Uh, the Rose of Jericho in her hands while she was giving birth to Jesus. So mm. the blooming is said to be a symbol of the opening and closing of the womb of the Holy Mother. <clears throat> so it has that kind of symboling, uh, symbolism with it. Um, and because of that, uh, it became um, used in hoodoo as a magical mm-hmm. and miraculous plant. It can bring peace and abundance and power to the home. Is it easily, can people grow it, or do you have to buy it, or or how do you get a hold of it? Yeah, you pretty much buy it from a a botanica. Um, Well, actually, you can get it off of Amazon now. You can get everything off Amazon. But, (laughs) you know, yeah, it's it's native to desert regions. Um, You know, I can't remember the exact country it comes from right off the top Mm. of my head, but... Mm -hmm. um, but it's not a plant that people normally grow. Okay. It, it would be a plant that you would, you know, you would go uh, harvest or out and, you know, gather if you were in the region. Mm-hmm. Well, it just sounds neat. I mean, it sounds really yeah. nice. That's why. Okay, good. All right. What is the lore about Marie uh, Laveau's wishing stump? The wishing stump. Um, that was uh, the wishing stump. Is a it's a it's a tree trunk that um, there was a hollow trunk and it was it functioned like a wishing well mm-hmm. and uh, it was it was on the lakeside of Bayou St John in New Orleans and uh, people would go there. It was a hollow tree trunk, so it had like a hole in it. And people would toss their money in there, coins, dollar bills. Um, they would burn candles around there. Um, and it, it, that's where they would um, place their wishes. Mm. So, um, yeah, there was a place where it was um, attributed to uh, Marie Laveau that it was a place where she did work. And just as time you know, went by, people just continued to use that spot as a wishing spot. Mm. Um, you know, petitioning her for for their wishes and making offerings, like I said, with their money and and whatnot. And there's a there's a stump in the New Orleans um, historic Voodoo Museum that is called a wishing stump. It's got some carvings in it of faces, and people can go there and they take their money and they'll write the petition, roll up a dollar bill, and the paper in the petition paper and then stick it in the hole in the stump there Hmm. um yeah and i talk about that in 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 the book obviously otherwise you wouldn't have picked (laughs) (laughs) but but, um yeah i kind of talk about how you can make one of your own if you wanted to out of the you know out of a stump around your area you know your area you just dedicate the stump to marie laveau and and use it in a similar manner oh that's really interesting i like that Mm mm-hmm Okay. Yeah. 
In the Materia Magica chapter, you talk about miniature coffins. <laughs> what yeah. are they used for? All kinds of good stuff. Um, <laughs> Marie Laveau, was, <laughs> she was very famous for her use of the little black coffins. And what she would do, among the things she would do with them, was, uh, you know, place a little doll in there that might represent an enemy, um, somebody who might be challenging her authority, um, or somebody had hired her to, you know, do a working against somebody. But she would take the little doll, she'd stick it in the little coffins, and they would be placed on the front porch um, with some candles. And, uh, you know, when you open the front door and then you, or if you walk up on your porch and you see a black coffin, you know, you know it's not good. <laughs> that whatever you're up to, you need to stop it. Mm. Um, and it was very effective. <clears throat> That's one of the things she would do. Um, there's all kinds of workings that she would um, do with these uh, little coffins, especially with the little dolls, because that's pretty much what she used them with, mm-hmm. that and Grigri. Sometimes she would make a little Grigri bag and stick, uh, put it on top of um, the coffin. But, um, you know, there's another one to, to make somebody go away, for example. Well, this isn't with the, with the coffin, though. Sorry, I'm getting I'm getting off on the doll part. But, mm. yeah, that's – so the, the, the coffins can be used – for crossings, so mm-hmm. for hexing, mm-hmm. um, but they can also be used for transforming one thing into another. So mm-hmm. just like you can use a doll for anything, you know, I mean, literally anything you want a doll to represent and and put an intention on, you can use a doll for. Well, the same thing with the coffin, but you would take like an old, like a bad habit, for example. So you can make a doll and name the doll for your bad habit stick it in the coffin and then bury it in a cemetery mm-hmm. and, um, you know, to transform that bad habit into something good. You could take it and you could plant, uh, you take it in your garden, you know, and plant it in a garden and plant a, a plant on top of it as the plant grows. You know, it's transforming that energy. So, um, yeah, anything, it's just like, like a tarot card, you know, that the death tarot card, you know, it doesn't mean death necessarily, mm-hmm. right? It can mean different things, so it's the same. It's the same concept when you're talking about working with um, coffins in mm-hmm. uh, voodoo. Okay, I've got more, but there's a question from the chat room, which is better than what I'm asking. Um, she says she doesn't know if she's wording it right, but here goes. She said she uh, that you use a good mix of light gray and dark voodoo hoodoo. Um, have you ever been tempted to go full dark on a spell? And if so, where were there any consequences or negative natures? Um, kind of questions like this, I kind of want to plead the fifth. Um, but <laughs> um, in voodoo and hoodoo, when you do workings like that, it has to be justified. Mm-hmm. If your work is justified, and what I mean by that is the, you do a, justif- a, a, work, a work like that for to restore balance. So say, you know, um, say your kid is raped, right? Say your daughter gets raped by somebody and you want to kill the person who raped her. Mm-hmm. Then the, the point of doing that is to, is, to, is to provide balance because whatever that person did totally disrupted the balance and the natural order of things. Mm-hmm. So a working to put somebody down in that, um, in that situation, not necessarily kill them, but cause some great strife and, and uh, um, you know, give them their just due. Yeah, return, a, punish them. return the favor. Right. Yeah. Right, right then it has to be justified. If it's not justified, then you will have repercussions. And even if it is, you have to be real careful with those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. One of, the, one of the, the, the rules that I go by is that I would never do a dark working like that with somebody who has children. Mm-hmm. I just don't. I just don't because there is collateral damage at times. Yeah. Um, I haven't ever experienced it because I have those rules that I put in place. But I've seen people who do that. And then a lot of people around their target get hurt. Mm -hmm. And that's not the point of it. You know, you don't want everybody around the the target to get hurt. And one of the reasons that that happens, too, is is because people don't 
people act out of emotions. And when yes. they act just out of emotions, then you're not disciplined in your in your work. And mm-hmm. you have to be very focused and very disciplined in your work in order to not have those kinds of repercussions. So you have to be, in addition to being justified for taking that kind of action, you have to be disciplined um, and very intentional in your work and very focused. So that, mm-hmm. um, and you have to set those boundaries. You know, for yeah. me. I don't want to take a chance. I'm very good at what I do. I'm very effective at what I do, but I would never want to take a chance because I'm human. Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to take a chance. I'm going to hurt a kid. So that's one of my, that's one of my, um, my particular roles. Yeah, no. And that's a good one, you know? Um, but people say, you know, magic and voodoo is not black or white. You know, it just is, is the way I see it. And people that say, they say that I could never do this, you know, my, I'm, I'm a Wiccan, for example, and, you know, ye harm none. But you know what? Sometimes you cross, you go into the gray, because if, if you see, you know, you're walking down the street with your child in hand, and somebody grabs that kid and runs, are you going to just sit there and say, I can't hurt him because he's got my child? You know, I yeah. mean, the, the instinct comes out that you're going to do something and cross the, the line. So... Yeah, I mean, they... well, go ahead. Exactly, and that's, I think that that's a, that is a, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to describe what I think about <laughs> that, but I hear that a lot, and I mm-hmm. think that every very effective practitioner is very familiar with their own shadow and the mm-hmm. shadow side of humanity. You have to be, because you can't work real light if you don't have the dark to define that light. Right. So you have to have that 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 self knowledge and that's part of what we were talking about before, just in the very beginning of our conversation about, you know, knowing your roots and knowing your craft, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. This is part of it. You know, you gotta know the whole the good, bad and the ugly to be able to be effective in any of it, in my opinion. Especially in Hoodoo and Voodoo, because we have a lot of these kinds of practices that um are um Conditional based. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, there's a couple interesting things. We're running out of time, but let me just talk about it for a minute. Um, some mm-hmm. of the recipes are actually edible, and I the the thing I opened the book to for that was spicy boiled peanuts. And see, we don't have boiled peanuts out here in California. I mean, it, I think isn't that kind of more of a southern thing? Yes, it is. Yeah, actually. But it um, sounds good. It is very good. They are very good. They are. Um, it, it, it's a snack, basically. It's yeah. just a boiled yeah. peanuts that are highly seasoned. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that that comes from the the recipe the. Mm, Conjure in the Kitchen chapter, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, where I gave a lot of recipes that are Creole, re- traditional Creole recipes that obviously you can eat. I mean, like, you know, um, um, Hop and John and things like that. Oh, I love Hop black and John. Eyed peas and, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there are also recipes that can double as offerings to any of the New Orleans voodoo spirits. So yeah, they're, that's a double um, purpose chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of good things in there. And, you know, I mean, you've got things, you know, different things to make like war water or um, peace water. Um, You talk about petition papers. I mean, you you cover all bases. I mean, there's nothing, um, you know, dust. You talk about magic dust and sachet powders and um, in the Sage Advice and Marvelous Secrets um, chapter, you talk about don't share your stuff. (laughs) <laughs> which is kind of important because, you know, you don't want people to harm your tools or take them away or put some boogie boogie on it. Um, <laughs> so right. what I'm trying to say is the book is full of really interesting things. And, and as you said, it's all over the place and, and the rep- recipes are good. And even things like um, catnip for healing. It's not mm-hmm. just for cats anymore, right? <laughs> I mean, no, no, no. It's um, it's it's a good healing herb. It's a 
In fact, uh, I, I cover several different herbs. I don't go into a whole lot of them. The mm-hmm. ones I included in my book are the ones that have scientific evidence to support um, their efficacy in medicine and in magic. So the folk remedies that grandma used to make, you know, um, mm-hmm. there's, there's, it's proven now that these things actually work. Yeah. Um, you know, we didn't, we don't need as folk practitioners, we don't need, you know, um, FDA's approval to, to, to prove it to us that these things work. We know they work because, well, they've been working for years and it's been yes. passed down. Mm-hmm. Um, Obviously, not all folk remedies work are effective, but there are a lot of them that that are and that were. And uh, so, the ones that I include in my book do, you know, um, do have that kind of uh, background, and, and they are safe when used uh, according to um, the proper guidelines. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, it's chock full of in- information, and as we're ready about to say good night. Please give out your website info, and I think I saw you have more than one. I have a lot of internet real estate, uh, probably. <laughs> well, yeah, I've got over fifty websites actually. Oh, but my main ones, yeah, I got a lot of websites. <laughs> but my main ones are um, my bread and butter website is creolemoon.com. That's where I sell candles and oils and powders and grigri and and those kinds of things. And then um, CrossroadsUniversity.com, that's where I teach. So I've got like 21 different kinds of courses. I've got the free course. I've got a couple that are very are $25 courses. And then I've got the full price courses um, that go for several months. And it's, uh, you know, anybody can come check it out and see what I've got to offer. And I'm offering a course for this particular book, the Marie Laveau Voodoo Grimoire Masterclass. And that's taking the information in the book and the stuff that didn't make it to print because you know how it is as an author, how we have, you know, we got to cut stuff out. Mm-hmm. Um, we can't publish everything because we have a page count, to, <laughs> a word count to, to meet. And yes. I always write too much material. So I take that material and I apply, you know, um, have it in the class so that people can, can learn about that stuff too that didn't make it to print. There you um, go. But it's all about, you know, how to, how to implement um, these just these practices into your daily life to have mm-hmm. a better life, mm-hmm. a more magical life. I really enjoyed the book, and um, you know, I skimmed through it well, and I, I jumped through it. You know, the, the mm-hmm. divination jumped through it, but there's just so much there, and it's so interesting. And and thank you for coming in and talking about it. Well, thank you so much for the invite. I I, I've, I really appreciate it. And we also appreciate the people that are listening in, too, whether it be live or podcast. So until next time, (laughs) until next time, everybody, blessed be and marry meet again. Good night. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Please join us again next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2024. The Mysterioso March by Kevin McLeod is licensed through Incompetech.com.